Michael Mahoney from State University of New York, College of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse. Michael will be presenting beaver foraging preferences and impacts on forest structure in New York's Adirondack Mountains. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to say, one of my colleagues works exclusively on, it's like cation density in leaf litter and fertilized plots. I work on beavers. I always have a much easier time filling a room. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I'm here to talk about beaver foraging and the impacts that it has on the forest of the Adirondacks. So when I say beavers, I mean specifically this guy here, Castor canadensis, the North American beaver. At the height of its population before settlement of North America, there were almost 400 million individuals living on the continent. Now, Following settlement, beavers were almost extirpated from the United States due to overhunting, overtrapping for the meat and for pelts. Uh, recent advances in protections for beaver have made their numbers start to increase somewhat, but their current populations are somewhere around 10 to 15 million individuals, nowhere near that 400 million maxima. And that matters a lot because other than humans, beavers are probably the organism with the single largest impact on the surrounding environment. Beavers are renowned for building dams and impounding large areas of streams behind them, uh, which lets them have greater access to forage area off to the side of their impoundments and also makes the stream service kind of a highway for beavers so they can get up and downstream faster, but has the side effect of creating these highly productive wetland areas that many other species are able to take advantage of. And when we extirpate, extirpated beavers, no one was maintaining the dams that made these areas possible anymore, and so a lot of them failed out opening these areas to succession and turning them into just more secondary interior forest. Now, in addition to beavers' flooding impacts, they're also known for their foraging behaviors. Beavers are what are known as central place foragers with regards to woody stems. They will go out and harvest woody stems and bring it back to a central food cache where they'll draw it from uh, throughout the winter. And as a result, when you get further away from the impoundment, it becomes more and more expensive energetically for beavers to be harvesting uh, these stems. As a result, we tend to see that beaver foraging activity is concentrated most close to the impoundment, and the further away you get from the impoundment, the more selective they are in harvesting only their preferred species and only their preferred size classes. We know from studies in other regions, such as Montana, Vancouver, uh, like the Southwest, that generally speaking, those size preferences are about two to five centimeters. Stems that are large enough to be, have some energetic return for dragging it back, but not so large that the haul cost is significant. We also see that they generally prefer early successional species, such as black cherry and aspens, and deciduous species significantly over coniferous. We know this largely from studies done in other regions, but no one had looked at beavers in the Adirondacks significantly yet, which we think matters because unique among most other forests, the Adirondacks has about 60% state protected land, which is forever wild as it's defined in the New York State Constitution, we are not allowed to cut down trees in this area. There is no human management. The other 40% of land in the Adirondacks also has pretty strict restrictions on what landowners can do with their forest land. And forests of the Northeast just have a very low disturbance regime to begin with. Stands in this area tend to have about a 5,000 year rotation age, uh, someone found in 2006. And as a result, beavers, as they start to reestablish back to their historic populations, are likely going to be one of the most important sources of disturbance in the Northeastern forest, and especially in the Adirondacks. And so we set off to the Adirondacks with three questions in mind. We wanted to see if, like in other regions, certain sizes, certain species were preferentially foraged and how those compared to the findings from other areas. We wanted to know if we could effectively predict those preferences using logistic models. And we wanted to know if beaver activity, both flooding and foraging, impacted forest structure in the surrounding area. And so we set off to the Adirondacks, setting up 19 field sites at uh, 13 lakes, or sorry, 13 streams and six lakes. At each of these sites, we would map out the furthest foraged stems in order to get a sense of the forage area that beavers were utilizing at these sites. We then set up four equidistant uh, transects around the impoundment, establishing plots every 10 meters until we were just outside of that forage area so that we got a sense of the interior forest as well. At each of those, or along each of these transects, we'd set up plot centers where we'd measure things like the uh, canopy cover as well as the cross valley slope. We'd then set up a two meter radius, so about 12 and a half square meter area plot within which would measure all the seedlings and all the woody vegetation in there, and would set up a larger four meter radius, so 50 square meter area plot, within which would measure all the woody vegetation five centimeters and larger. Now, on the series of graphs I'm about to show, you'll notice the x-axis is pretty universally distant, starting at four meters and incrementing 10 meters every plot. That's a result of this uh, sampling design. That four meter plot was established, so it just barely touched the impoundment rather than measuring over the water. And so, what we found is, like in other regions, foraging is concentrated pretty close to the impoundment. 
You'll notice there's a weird blip at 14 meters here just as a result of that variable length transect I mentioned. A lot of our transects ended at 14 meters with no foraging, so that number's artificially low. But even with that, you can still see a general linear trend decreasing in forage intensity as we get further away from the impoundment and harvesting becomes more energetically intensive. We also found that two to five centimeters was kind of the sweet spot for stem size that beavers would forage. Again, like we found in other reasons, it's, or regions. It's that darker color in this graph here. It's, this is showing the percent of available stems harvested that are of each diameter class. And this is no great surprise. Like we found in other regions, those are the stems that are more energetically efficient for them to be hauling back to their food cache. We also found that deciduous species were strongly preferred, again, the dark bar here, almost to the exclusion of coniferous species, which is notable because about 75% of our plots were coniferous species. So it's not a simple matter of, oh, this is what is here. Beavers were very actively seeking out the deciduous species to harvest. Combining all those together into logistic models, we were able to demonstrate a serious preference for closer stems of intermediate size of coniferous species. The lighter colors in these surface plots are stems that are more likely to be harvested. And as we can see, for both the overall stem group, but also deciduous and coniferous stem groupings, those intermediate stems closer to the impoundment are significantly more likely to be harvested than anything further away or larger. Now, where our results start to diverge from those found in other regions is when we go into our individual species. Our individual most preferred species were things like yellow birch, which is just not present in other studies of beaver foraging preferences, and American beech, which has been shown in other regions to be actively avoided. Now, the most likely reason for that is that their preferred species, the early successional uh, quaking aspen, black cherry, things like that, are almost not present along streams in the Adirondacks because of the lack of uh, because of the lack of new forest in these areas, there's just not a ton of those preferred species for beaver to be harvesting. And so they're kind of stuck with their best worst option is what we think, things like American beech. We can also see that coniferous species are all disfavored about the same. Red spruce, balsam fir, which are the two most common species in our plots, have almost no harvesting at any distance. Moving on to the impacts that we were seeing on the surrounding forest, we found that in uh, the closer you were to a beaver impoundment, the more gaps there were in the canopy cover, which isn't particularly surprising. Beaver cut down trees, more gaps in the canopy. But what we noticed is there's a significant difference between the amount that streams are opened versus lakes, implying that the flood impacts are actually having a larger impact on canopy cover than the foraging itself. When beaver are flooding up and creating these impoundments, we're seeing a lot of flood-related mortality opening a lot of gaps in the canopy. Now, we're also seeing that seedling density generally increases as we get further into the interior forest to the extent that certain species uh, seedling densities actually correlate with canopy closure. Now we think this is again a result of that flood impact that I mentioned, that these areas that are more inundated with water, more saturated, just aren't as conducive to seedling germination. And so we're only seeing seedling establishment further into the interior forest. Additionally, these three species, American beech balsam for red maple, are all known to be relatively shade tolerant during their seedling stage, and as a result, are likely having more success in the interior forest than they would uh, closer to the impoundment anyway. So, just to revisit what we went over or what we found, uh, beavers preferred stems that were of that small intermediate stem size and closer to the impoundment, and of their preferred species, which differed from those found in other regions. We found that flooding and foraging both have large impacts on the surrounding repairing and community and that these patterns are generally similar to those found in other regions, but not identical. As far as why any of this matters, <laughs> uh, beaver populations, as I mentioned, are going to increase. We're at about 10 to 15 million beaver in North America right now, compared to a 400 million maximum. And as a result, the conflicts that we're seeing between humans and beavers are likely going to increase as well. Beavers are known for flooding out a lot of agricultural land. Seems like it's the end of that clicker. <laughs> Beavers are known for flooding out a lot of agricultural land, destroying forests, and ruining people's nice yards and other infrastructure uh, things that we value a lot. As such, moving forward, the management challenges associated with beaver are going to increase, but also the opportunities associated with them. Because, for instance, a lot of animals really enjoy the sorts of habitats that beavers create. Steelhead trout uh, use the nutrient-rich ponds that form behind beaver dams uh, for their habitat. Things like mink frogs are able to use these areas as climate refugia as the world continues to warm. And animals like mallards and other similar waterfowl are able to use the macroinvertebrate communities that form behind dams in order to turn marginal habitats into areas that they can thrive. As a result, knowing the impacts that beavers are going to have in this region moving forward is going to be crucial to un 
or to understanding how we can intelligently manage this resource moving forward. So, with all that said, I'd like to thank my collaborators of Rachel Zevin and Harrison, as well as Jerry Carlson and the uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation for funding assistance. And thank you. How did you uh, define seedling? And because uh, I'm interested in the difference in the foraging behavior between here and other areas. So, if you planted sugar maple in there, do you think that they would prefer that? So. There weren't a ton of sugar maple in our plots. As far as the first part of that question, defining seedling, uh, seedlings were things under one centimeter diameter and one meter in height, uh, which we had to make both of those the distinction because things like um, speckled alder would grow to over a meter but still under a centimeter in diameter. Uh, we didn't have a ton of sugar maple in these plots, but from studies done in similar regions, including Huntington Research Forest in the middle of the Adirondacks, sugar maple seems to be semi-preferred it's not their favorite species, uh, but it is more favored than the average. As such, while you would have some beaver-related mortality, it's probably deer and things like that that are more worrisome. Yeah. So in addition to the benefits to some of the wildlife, are you starting to see some of the more permanent kind of wetland kind of veg communities that are coming in with some of these areas? Yeah. And I mean, as you're seeing, you know, I don't know what, what the time scale is, how long beaver have been yeah, so the Adirondacks is unique in that it might be one of the only areas in North America that beaver were never fully extirpated from. Uh, there seem to be a few pockets of long-term beaver colonies. Uh, as far as the wetlands that they're establishing, we know that beaver tend to come into an area and exploit the resources around it, and as soon as they deplete all of their preferred species, move somewhere else. And so long-term studies have been showing uh, in the Huntington Research Forest, for instance, uh, you can see beaver colonies establishing 20 to 30 years, and then they'll move on. But when they're moving on, as populations are increasing, they're creating wetlands in other areas. The dams tend to last somewhere five to 10 years after they abandon them, uh, but the, they're still moving to other places and creating new wetland habitat there. Yeah? Yeah, they will actually, so uh, in other regions, there's no quaking aspen here, so it's not a factor here. In other regions, what generally happens is they move in, eat all of the quaking aspen in an area and completely extirpate it from the site and then move somewhere else. Yeah? Uh, has there been more blowouts of beaver dams or the I don't know that I actually have an answer for that. I don't, I have not heard anyone talk about that with active dams, and I'm not sure if anyone's been looking at it for the abandoned areas. But that'd be really interesting. I can back, get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah? This may be beyond the scope of this, but um, in terms of beaver coming back and having more interactions with humans, so the Adirondacks, as you explained, is a special place where that's not really going to be an issue, but in terms of like beaver re-entering in general, do you, do you know about like how likely it is that they will reestablish in high numbers where there are people already like, you know, I've heard about people like trapping beaver because they're getting to their houses and stuff. Yeah, so there's a lot of interesting work from Massachusetts right now on this, uh, looking at doing uh, surveys of landowners and saying, oh, what's your historical sense of like how much of a problem beaver have been? What's your sense currently? And almost everyone is reporting that they're having more challenges with beavers right now than they have been in the past. And so a lot of work, for instance, uh, Rachel is building a model for the full Adirondacks, uh, trying to predict which areas beaver are going to pose challenges to infrastructure uh, so that they can be proactively managed and try to dissuade them from those areas. Because especially with the Adirondacks, there's the challenge of, we just established a land bank, so this isn't as big of an issue anymore, but trying to use any protected land in order to repair infrastructure and things like that has been a huge concern. You have to amend the New York State Constitution to do so. <laughs> and so there's a lot of work right now trying to predict that. But we know that beaver are coming back in ways that landowners are starting to notice. And so we're trying to predict where they'll be going in order to try and get ahead of them with the management concern. Yeah? I wanted to make sure I understood that the two to five centimeter was the the stem that they're cutting down, or is that the stem they're dragging back from a larger tree? 
that will be the stem that they cut. So that's diameter at the point of cut. Yeah, they will harvest larger trees sometimes of aspen, almost no other species. Uh, and even then, they'll usually section it, only drag back branches and things that are that size. Any other questions? Okay, right. Thank you very much. Thank you.